Let me just record. Okay, so today, today is like, today we'll be looking at, just for recording purposes, let me just, uh, we'll be looking at the organization of the human body, lab session number one. The important, so the important, why is it important that the body is organized the way it is? Yes, go ahead. In terms of the response, what are you saying? So it's a function the way it does. Yeah. One of the things which oftentimes we don't think about it, but the body is a machine and it's a very effective and efficient machine. For it to do the things that it does efficiently, it has to be organized in a particular way. And that's why in terms of the organization, it's very important when you look at the body, it's organized in a specific way. It's not, these things are not just put in there haphazardly. So when we're looking at the organization of the body, certain anatomical terms are referenced and we'll speak more to them in just a little bit. For now, let's look at some of the organs associated with the human torso. First of all, we have the liver. Liver, largest organ in the body by mass, right? And here is the liver, it runs across the midsection of the body itself, the stomach, very important is the terminal part of the esophagus, which comes down and empties into the stomach. Contents of the stomach then go from the stomach. Where do you go to? Your large or the small intestine? Which one? Small intestine. The small. Let me ask this other question. Small intestine and large intestine. Which one is longer and why? Small the small intestine is large, longer, that is very true. And why do you think one word begins absorption. with A? There you go, very good. Yeah, absorption, well done, Jamila. Because of the fact, most of the nutrients in the body, they're absorbed in the small intestine, so it's longer than the large intestine. What is the one major thing that is absorbed in the large intestine? One word begin with W. Water. Water, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Water. So therefore, if something goes wrong with, in terms of the absorption of water in the large intestine, what will your stools look like? Your feces, how would it look like? Because remember, the absorb, water is absorbed in the large intestine. So if you don't absorb the water, what will happen? Will your stools look firm and nice or will they be watery? Like Milo. Like Milo. <laughs> It's spraying it all over the tank, yeah? And you know, that happens sometimes when you get diarrhea. And the thing is, with, when, you, when you have, so watery stools, when you see watery stools, very important, you're losing a lot of water. Not only are you losing water, but you're also losing a lot of salt. Salt, yeah? And why is salt important in the body? First of all, let me take a little step back. How many organ systems do we have in the body, by the way? 11. 11, right? You can name them. You know, there's a, a nice little mnemonic or a word to remember it, unsliced RRM. You know, like if you, when you do a slice of bread, it is unsliced. Let's see if we could go through them and let's see if we can remember those organ systems. You, what organ system begins with you? Urinary. Urinary, Urinary. consists of the kidneys and the associated structures, right? Very important, right, for reg water regulation in the body. N. Nervous. Nervous system. The nervous system acts with two other organ systems to bring about movement. Which other organ systems are there to bring about movement? Skeletal and muscle. Skeletal and muscle. Very good. All right. So we have U, we have N, we have S. L stands for? Lymphatic. Lymphatic system. And that's where you will find cells of the immune system, the white blood cells. And you also have tissue fluid that keeps all the tissues moist. Lymphatic eye. Skin, hair, and nails. Begin. Integumentary. The integumentary. That is the one of the, it has, you know, it's a long word, integumentary. But skin, hair, and nails, very important for protection. U-N-S-L-I-C. C stands for heart, body. Well, you could argue that your respiratory system and your lymphatic, they are both circulatory. So there's a very specific term. And in some books, you would see it, but you could say there's a better word for it. It begins with C as well and rhymes with cardiovascular. Cardiovascular. Excellent, excellent, brilliant, brilliant. Brain and beauty, very good. Cardiovascular system. So that's the, you would see circulatory, but as I could say, you could argue that the respiratory system and the lymphatic, they're also circulatory. So to be a little more specific, 
you'll say cardiovascular. And what does the cardiovascular consist of? The heart, blood vessels, and of course, most critically, blood, right? Okay, U-N-S-L-I-C-E. This has to do with your okay. hormones. Endocrine, very good, Julia. The endocrine system. And what is one of the major hormones? I suppose, I don't want to say the main, but the first one that comes to mind, right? It affects you in terms of increasing your heartbeat and is associated with the fight or flight system, a reflex action in your body. It has to, it could be either, um, you could call it E, it could begin with E or it could begin with E, depending on which word you use. Adrenaline. Adrenaline, Adrenal. and what other word? The Adrenal. other name for it? Adrenal. Adrenal. So, no, no, adrenaline is right. And or it could, uh, there's another name for adrenaline, it begins with E. And it rhymes with meph. <laughs> it rhymes with epineph. <laughs> okay, epinephrine. So I couldn't think of a word that rhymes with epinephrine. But epinephrine and adrenaline is the same thing, right? So which is why for persons who have, let's say, um, what do they call it? Allergies, they have an epipen, right? Epinephrine pen. And all that has in it is really adrenaline. And what that does when they do inject themselves, it's a bronchodilator. It opens out the passages of the lungs, um, the bronchioles. And if they don't do that, of course, the person would suffocate. So some persons, they have allergies when they do, let's say in common, they get a bee sting, they have this react, allergic reaction that causes you know, the bronchioles to dilate and it could lead to suffocation if not addressed. U-N-S-L-I-C-E-D. We're looking at it right here. Digestive system. Why do we eat? Why do we eat? The nutrients and energy. Energy, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Right? So we do it to actually get energy. And that is very, very important. Without it, if we didn't eat, we wouldn't get any energy. And um, yeah, that'll be the end, of our, the end of our existence. And energy in the body is in the form of three letters. What are those three letters? ATP, I don't know, sign triphosphate. ATP, right? Adrenaline, adenosine triphosphate. And the good thing is it's a standardized, um, standardized so that it could be used anywhere in the body. So you don't have a nose hole ATP to move your nose hole and you don't have a little toe ATP to move your little toe. One standard ATP could be used in your nose hole or for your little toe. Right, And that is very efficient. Back to the body being a machine is a lot more efficient than having one currency as it will use in the body. It's just like using your links card, right? You could use a links card to go buy Rattan. You could go in the mall, same card. You could go KFC and get back and buy your chicken now and get your condiments for no, you'd rather pay $2 for that anymore, right? So all of these things, very important, right? In terms of their um, usage. So body, very, it's a very good machine in that regard. U-N-S-L-I-C-E-D, which is the digestive R. Respiratory, very good. And why do we need oxygen, which is the major gas we extract from the air? Why do we need oxygen? For our cells. Yeah, for the cells. But what, what do we use oxygen for? Three words, break down what? What do we break down with the oxygen? Is a word that right F double O. Last letter. Food. Food, yeah. So we use oxygen to break down food to get energy. And that's why we that's why we breathe in. All right. So very critical oxygen. And sometimes you might see the equation oxygen plus food gives you carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And this energy is in the form of ATP. All right. So very important there in terms of respiration. What the other R is, which is the most critical thing. Reproduction. Reproduction. What would happen if we didn't reproduce? End of the species. End of the species will become extinct. Very good, Michelle et al. and others, right? We'd become extinct. And remember, the main reason for us being here is really to keep the species going, right? So reproduction, very, very important. Uh, R, R, and the last one, M. Muscular. Muscular system interacts with the skeletal and nervous system to bring about movement, okay? So those are the 11 organ system. You can remember it, unsliced, Mr. R or RRM 
Yeah, okay. Session is being recorded and it would be posted um, by tomorrow on the page. Okay, let's go. So here is the torso, again, showing the different structures. Now we see here blue, some things are in blue, some things are in red. Is blood ever blue? No. No. So why do no. they put it blue here? Because right. oxygenated and deoxygenated. Mm -hmm. Oxygenated and deoxygenated. So therefore deoxygenated blood is blue? Look at your wrist, turn your wrist. If you were to look at your wrist, all right, you see, are you getting seen something greenish by your wrist? If you look at your yes. wrist, anybody? Yes. So, yes. so that yes. means that your blood green, not so blue green, not so. No, <laughs> I don't think so. No, okay. Not so, but you look at, arteries. But in the end, look, look at your wrist, and you're seeing blue thing, blue green thing under your skin. What is that? That's my vein. Well, you're, partially, you're partially right. <laughs> what you're seeing there is actually the blood flowing through your veins, but also you're seeing it through your skin and the vein itself, and it appears blue. But I assure you, blood is never blue. If ever you're in casualty or in your professional setting and somebody come in and you see blue blood, what do you do? Run. Run. <laughs> run far and run fast. Right? I mean, San Fernando, you run until you reach library corner. And then you wait now. Nah, that was blue blood I, I see quit. there. I don't care. Right? If it's but blue blood, just keep running. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So I go and quit. I give up that. Wreck is right. But this is Trinidad. Right. We're going to post it up on Facebook. They, <laughs> you know, before I tell yeah. you, before you even reach library corner, you're seeing about 100 people on post up. Hey, look what I see. Today in work, you know, blue blood. And they're holding up a little vial with blue blood. But blood is never blue. The only reason they put it blue here is really for you to tell the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated, right? But it's never, ever blue, you know? And I didn't appreciate that. I went through sixth form and I actually taught and the teacher used to tell you know blood is blue I was like you know I was like okay I really thought for a while it was blue but what you're seeing is just blood uh, so it's, a, it's like an illusion then it's seen through your skin and through your vein and it appears blue what you're seeing there but blood is actually never blue so it's red plus your veins plus your skin gives you that color but always remember blood is never ever blue if you do see it always remember run so here we are seeing the circulatory system from your heart itself. So when you're thinking of the heart, there are two circulatory systems. You have the pulmonary circulation. When you hear the word pulmonary, to what organ does it refer to? Lung. Lungs. Lungs, very good. And which word um, relates to the heart is a word that begins with C. Coronary. Cardiac. Cardiac or coronary, coronary, you're right, in terms of the arteries. So you're quite right, and I'm mad at you in terms of both of them. So the pulmonary circulation refers to blood leaving the heart, going to the lungs, and then you have the systemic circulation when it goes throughout the entire body. So blood leaving the heart is oxygenated, and when it returns via the inferior and superior vena cava, it actually comes in with a lesser amount or is deoxygenated. So it comes in, and then it goes to the lungs via what? The pulmonary vein or artery. Pulmonary artery. What you say now is very brave, and you're quite correct. You say it loud and proud, all right? And it's quite correct. I, my, that's why I remember the A is far away from the heart. Yeah, very good. Normally, arteries carry oxygenated blood, with the exception of the pulmonary artery. And similarly, veins carry deoxygenated blood, with the exception of the pulmonary vein. Why it is then? Do you think they call it the pulmonary artery, even though it's carrying deoxygenated blood? Why do you think they call it a, an a, an artery? Any any guesses? So it's another definition associated with veins and arteries. All right, let me see if somebody could pick it up. Look at this diagram and see if you could pick it up. What is unique about veins and arteries when you think about it? There's the heart. What is unique? So these are the veins. Well, the arteries mm -hmm. are bigger than the veins. That's one, right? And there's another characteristic. In one terms carry, of direction. Uh, yeah, one carries blood away from the heart. And Thank you very much. One so, blood to the... so the arteries usually carry blood away from the heart and the veins, right? Like the inferior and superior, they bring blood 
to the heart. So in terms of definition, the blood is leaving the heart and going to the lungs. So that's why they call this one the pulmonary artery because it's actually leaving the heart. Sorry, sorry, the pul yeah, the pulmonary artery, pulmonary, uh, it's pulmonary veins, sorry, leaving the heart, carry, carrying deoxygenated blood um, and going to the lungs itself, returning it is returned by the pulmonary vein. Yeah. So they use that rubric in terms of leaving the heart is the artery, pulmonary artery, bringing it back is the vein, even though leaving it, it carrying the oxygenated blood in that regard. All right, so here is all the different circulations to deliver the major organs, and these are shown here. All right, so these are the parts of the torso. We went through them in terms of the structure of the organs themselves as related to the different organ systems, all right? Digestive, spleen, what does the spleen do? Major function of the spleen. Has to do with, is associated with which organ system? White blood cell. No. Yeah, in terms of red blood cells, you, you weren't too far off. And when you're in theater, if somebody presents, let's say with a stab wound or gunshot wound and they do open and they see a lot of blood, it could be that the spleen, spleen is ruptured because the spleen actually holds quite a bit of volume of blood. You know, so if it does rupture um, by a puncture wound or gunshot, you usually have a lot of blood. So of course, you know, that's one of the things that they look for. If they do open and they see it, a lot of blood, they say it's probably the spleen that's gone. Kidneys, right? On the top of the kidneys, you have the adrenal gland. And what does the adrenal gland give off? Adrenaline or epinephrine. Right, very important hormone. And when epinephrine is released into the system, it causes you to increase heart rate, it dilates your pupils, right? That's what it does, it's adrenaline. Right here is the torso again, I'm showing you the different structures, the kidneys, and also the arteries and veins, which go towards the kidneys themselves. In this area, what do we usually have here? It's not shown. What do we have here at the end of the, um, coming down here, we have the ureters. Over, usually behind here, what organ do we have? A big organ, the largest organ in the body by mass. Behind, to the back of the kidney. Liver. 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 Oh, liver. Yeah, correct. You have the liver to the back. All right. Here we have the esophagus that is cut, that is shown in section there. Of course, the bladder. Voiding the bladder, you have the urethra. Coming from the kidneys, you have the ureter. How would you not mix them up? Because both of them, you know, they look similar. Anybody have a way to remember that the ureter comes before the urethra? Well, you could argue that if you're looking at the letters U, U, R, R, E, E, T, T, E, H. E comes before H in the alphabet, yes? So if you take off all of these letters, because U R E T, because both of them have U R E T, the next letter is an E and an H. E comes before H in the alphabet. That's how I remember it. So I know the ureter then will be above, and the urethra, that's the one that empties the bladder. Okay? And the next thing they're showing you here, of course, is the female reproductive system, uterus. Now, interesting, right here is the vaginal wall. Right? So the sperm, after ejaculation, the sperm has to go from here all the way up to the neck of the fallopian tube. So let me ask you this. If a sperm was about six feet tall, if you could imagine that, had the ability to walk. Everybody familiar with the South Campus? Have you been down? Anybody haven't been to the South Campus? No, yes, but I've yeah. yeah. I I OK, so you have an idea where it is and where it is. All right. So imagine. On the South Campus, a sperm six feet tall. If it had, if you were looking at distance from moving from the vagina up until the neck of the fallopian tube where fertilization occurs, how far would that sperm have to walk? If it was six feet tall, would it have to walk A from, let's say, from the top floor to the bottom floor in terms of the custard building, B from the top floor to the top of Sutton Street, or C from the top floor to Monrepo Roundabout? Down by the fire station. Which one do you think? How far would it have to go? 
if it's Occident, six feet tall? Tall? if it was six feet tall and could walk a sperm so in other words you're looking at this distance relative distance coming from the vagina after ejaculation uh -huh. to the neck of the fallopian tube where fertilization occurs how far is that if it was if you were to you know increase the distances then and the sperm was six feet tall how far this would be to the junction yeah it would actually be to monopo yeah in terms of if the, how, how far the sperm has to go, it's like walking from Costat, you know, down on Sutton Street, all the way up to Monrepo. So you're going up, walking up to Supero Street, walk up Supero Street, turn on coffee, you know, and go wrong Royal Road until you reach the fire station. It's very far. So they, when you think about it, it's really incredible. Sir, I lost, eh? Oh, you lost? I lost. Because I don't yes, know. Sir, I lost you. Oh, okay. I, I, I okay. But let's just say, in terms of the distance, okay, just very simply, in terms of the distance, is approximately, I would say, uh, about a mile and a half. If it was six feet tall, it would have to go a mile and a half to reach the distance. If, you know, you're looking at the same distance if, from here to here, but if this one was six feet tall, it will have to go a mile and a half. So it's a very long distance, actually, which is why so much sperm is actually produced, just to make sure all you need is one, you know, in terms of fertilization. You'd speak more to that when you get to fertilization in SNF2. Here is you're looking at the fallopian tube in section. This is the bladder, uterus, the cervix, of course, as the muscle of the uterus. So implantation occurs in the uterine wall. This is where you have the development of the fetus and the baby itself. The male reproductive system, right? So here, yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, heard of anyone with a double um, cervix? Or no. did it call it a duplex cervix? Does it occur? Duplex cervices, that's in no. medical too. It's but it does exist, yeah? Yes, it does. What you're saying, that's incredible. You, you, you ever spoke to um, Dr. Sata about it? You know her specialty area is reproductive biology? No. Well, okay, yeah. So anything related to, yeah. Yeah, so that was her area of research. She could talk to her about that, man. Yeah, she did her work over there in England. Uh, you could talk to her about that. But that's incredible. I didn't realize, you know, it could have a, um, a double uterus. That is, in, in, that is, wow. So it have no, a case where a woman, um, she gave, I think she gave good with mm -hmm. two uterus. She didn't even know she was pregnant. Then he said mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uterus. Mm -hmm. She gave birth, it was two babies instead of one. Mm -hmm. I it, have, no way it have double uterus. It, it mm -hmm. is called, mm -hmm. it's called a biconiate uterus, but mm -hmm. it also mm -hmm. have persons with a normal uterus or abnormal shaped uterus, not two mm -hmm. uterus, but two cervices. Mm. Interesting. That's very interesting. Two cervices, wow. Oh. You live and you learn. I did not know that. Thanks for bringing me up to speed. I did not know that. Wow. That's really, that's really impressive. Uh, yeah, that's great. Tell you the, the body is really incredible in terms of that. Okay, let's go forward. So here it is in section, the male reproductive system. Here you're looking at the testes. And one of the things with the male, you would recognize that the testes, it doesn't lie within the torso, but it's actually outside. Why is that so? Why is it important? Because it mm -hmm. needs to keep it, it needs to be a so warm for the semen. So healthy correct for the sperm mm -hmm. in terms of the yeah, proper yeah. formation of the sperm which will ultimately lead as you rightly say to proper um semen because semen semen is nothing more than sperm plus um other things which are added to it from the prostate gland seminal vesicle right prostate and bulbo urethral gland these they add contents to it that actually now that is very important and i'll tell you why good thing you bring that up the environment of the vagina is it acidic or is it basic acidic and why looking at it if you look anatomically why is it acidic because of the proximity to the you know yeah so remember yeah there's a lot of bacteria in your gut that come out, you know, in terms of fecal matter and also 
so it's very easy for infect for these bacteria to get across here. If this wasn't acidic, you'd always get infections. You'd have a lot, a lot of infection occurring here. So the environment here is acidic. So how does that relate to semen? So the semen, it has to be very basic. And the reason why, because there's a neutralization type reaction that occurs, um, acid plus a base gives you salt and water. So it's actually, this environment has to be neutralized or else literally the sperm will be cooked by the acidic environment. So that's why secretions from the prostate and the bulbar urethral gland and seminal vesicles. So the sperm are produced, but you have secretions from these glands. They actually make it basic, very basic, the semen, such that now it could actually enter the vagina and not get cooked, literally. If it was acidic, it would be cooked. Uh, anybody, for those who live in by the um, sea and so on, uh, or those cooks, uh, you're, you're probably heard about ceviche. Yes, sir. Yes, right? sir. And I just cook, you, know, you could use the acid from what? Where is you, where, where is get the acid from? Lemons. Lemons lime. or lime, correct is right. Right, so that is a mean of cooking, means of cooking without actually using a fire. Right, you could take the fish and just squeeze it on it. And sometimes if you're seasoning fish, you'll see it. You know, the fish will be kind of the transparent in terms of the flesh. But when you squeeze the lime, it gets opaque and white. Yeah, that, it cooked, quote unquote. So you have a change in structure. And that would happen to the sperm. They would get cooked and that'll be the end of the story. You wouldn't have no pregnancy occurring. So to get around that, the secretion from those glands makes it very basic. So that once it comes in here, neutralization reaction, sperms could go ahead and get to the neck of the fallopian tube, where for, ideally where fertilization could occur. And uh, from there, of course, implantation ideally in the uterus. But as we know, does implantation always take place in the uterus? No, sir. No. No. Ectopic right? pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is very good. It could take place all over the place, you know, a number of different areas it could take place in. Very good. So this again is just showing the, um, the male reproductive system in section. It's showing the seminal and prostate as well, uh, as shown here. Now, one of the things here, the prostate, right? The prostate is really like a, it's shown here, it's really like a donut. And through the prostate runs the urinary bladder. So what happens if the prostate swells? What do you think will happen to the urinary, sorry, the urethra? It's the urethra that runs through it here. What do you think will happen? So think about a donut with a hole and through it you have the urethra. So if the prostate swells, what would happen to the urethra, do you think? obstruction. Yeah, yeah, correct. It will squeeze it, it will get obstruction. And that is, no, I forget the medical term, but very simply is when I stop blockage of water or stoppage of water. And that is painful. Imagine you want to urinate and you cannot because you have this blockage. That's like right. kidney stones. Very similar. I like the parallel. Yeah. Very similar to that. You have this blockage. Yeah. All right. So what, what do they have to do to get it to, if it is that the prostate is swollen, what do they have to do? I don't know if steroids will actually, because you know, anytime I hear steroid inflammation, you think about steroids to decrease it. But sometimes what they will do is take a catheter and they thread it. Of course, they have to give a localized um, anesthetic and they thread, yeah, they run the catheter up here to actually open out the space. So a catheter is a flexible tube. And depending on the, on the situation, they'll use different types of catheters. They run it up and then they blow up. It's like a balloon at this stage and it opens it up, all right? It opens up and now you can have the free flow. Usually the swelling might, might go down um, so they wouldn't have to leave the catheter in, but sometimes they have to leave it in or go in and actually have surgery where they actually shave the prostate, right? Shave it off to create more space for the urethra in that regards, yep. All right, now these are just directional terms. And I would, you'll be worth your while to learn these uh, directional terms. It'll become very important when you get in, if you get into theater in particular, in terms of these anatomical directions, right? Um, these are also some other anatomical directions and also locations of the body, the thoracic, abdominal, and 
pelvic regions. And this is in the anatomical position with the palms upwards, facing upwards. And there's another thing you would notice when you, if somebody presents in casualty and they're unconscious, usually for some reason, uh, when, you, when they bring them in on the gurney and they're on their backs, the palms usually face upward, right? If it turn inward, it could be a sign that there is a brain injury. So that is something as well you look for very simply if somebody you know is brought in if the palms are facing downward it could it could indicate that you know there is injury to the brain itself because usually your palms are always kept up when they put you down this is Thank a you. yeah go ahead so i'm glad you um brought up that because um we had a quiz and there was a little issue with um the position of the hands in the anatomical position mm -hmm. One of the questions um, was saying that, you know, the palms are towards the thighs, facing towards the thighs. So I know Miss um, was supposed mm -hmm. to get back for a but as you are talking about it, so you can elaborate mm -hmm. on that. The anatomical position, sure. In fact, let's see if you could get a diagram to actually show it to you, make it even clearer. Just waiting for it to come up. All right, I don't know if you could see it here. Sharing. Okay, so any anatomical position. Right, the body is upright, directly facing the observer, feet flat. The upper limbs are the body side with the palms facing forward. Yeah. So any anatomical position. The arms are facing, the palms are facing forward like this, yeah? Yeah? Yes, sir. I understand that, but the, um, the question, right? I don't know if it, it had was it like facing towards the thigh. Yeah. Um, but the options what, that they give. I was not going to say that. Here. I was not going to yeah. say that. Depending on the options, that might have been the best choice, which would indicate like a slight turn towards the midline. So maybe that would have been the best option based on what you were given. But in true anatomical form, it really faces forward, as shown here in this diagram. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay. So we're almost there. All right, so this is showing um, in terms of the body regions, right? The cephalic, 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 of course, refers to the head, the occipital region. You look at that when you're looking at the skeletal. You have the occipital, parietal uh, regions of the skull itself. Here's the calcaneal. Of course, what bone is located here? Your calcaneus, which is your heel bone. And this here, this is, um, what, what is here? Is this a bone here? Just superior to the calcaneus and attaching to the calf muscle or your, also known as your gastrocnemius muscle. So what is it? It's a tendon. And what's yes, the name of is. this? 
Yeah, the Achilles tendon. And this is the biggest one in the body itself. It's a huge tendon. If you rupture this, you'll have no move. You have to drag your leg. You'll have no movement of the foot at all, right? So this is very important. Yeah, and you can feel it. Just feel for your heel and right above your heel. You'll feel something. It feels like a bone. It feels like a soft bone. That's actually Achilles tendon, all right? Oops. So the planes. Do take note of these planes, right? You will be asked them in the quiz. Um, you have the frontal, sagittal. Frontal goes across sagittal. We have any, for those of us who follow the houses of the zodiac, quote unquote, Sagittarius. We have any Sagittarius persons here? What is the sign for Sagittarius? Is it like, um, anybody? Um, kind of half man, yeah, off. I think half and half. I was hoping somebody from Sagittarius would, would bail me out. But it's a half and half. So in this case, as you see, sagittal section is straight down the center. And the frontal or coronal going from side to side. And transverse, of course, here. All right. So very simply, you know, on the quiz, what you could have is these very same things without any labels on them. And you have to label them. Or you have a choice and you have to choose from them. So do pay attention to this one, the body planes, as well as the body cavities. So what we have, what do we find in the cranial cavity? The brain. brain. You do find the brain. Uh, let me ask this question. Um, is there a break between the brain and the spinal cord? Or is it continuous? Is the brain continuous with the spinal cord? Or is there a little space where, you know, right around here? So I would think it's continuous. Continuous, yeah. What will happen if you have a break? One word begins with P. Paralysis. Or some type. Yeah, yeah, some type or degree of paralysis if you have a break. So even though it's often shown separately, do remember the spinal cord is continuous with the cranium over the brain. Always remember that. There's no break. If you have a break, you have some issues going on in terms of paralysis. Because the vertebra, the first one is the Atlas vertebra, then you have the axis, and then you have the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, coccygeal, and so on, in terms of the vertebra. All right. Right. In terms of the membranes, you do have these membranes. And what do they do? Right. You have the pericardium, peri meaning a wrong. And the cardia, of course, we mentioned that refers to the heart. It covers the heart. What do you think? So the pericardium, if you could go back, all right? So here we have the heart. So what do you think the pericardium protects the heart from rubbing against what? Here it is, the, the heart. Yeah. What would happen if it rubbed against the lung, long term? What do you think would happen? It do wear down, cause a tear or something. Thank you, very good. Would that be a problem if your heart had a hole in it? Yeah. yeah. That would be a very big problem. That would be a very big problem if it had a hole, if it leaked. Physically and emotionally. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Now, on the topic of emotion, I'm glad you brought it out. You know, a lot of songs always talking about, you know, don't go breaking my heart. You know, I love you with all my heart. Anybody know why it is they always make reference to the heart in terms of emotion? Anybody knows? You know, when you look at um, Valentine. Heart. When you look at Valentine, you see heart, you know, okay, Cupid is my heart. Why it is? Why, why is all of this, you know, why it is? Because of the shape. Because of the shape of the heart? Yeah. Okay. All right. But don't mm -hmm. the heart, when you get heartbreak, emotional stress, don't they put stress on the heart? So that's why? All right. We could argue that quite right, quite right in terms of, you know, you do have issues with the heart. Yes, yes. We can Anything live without else? it. Yes, yes, yes. All of you all touching on it, tiptoeing on it. At one time, remember, our knowledge now, of course, we know that in terms of emotion, things related to emotion or cognitive thought, things that make us uniquely human, is related to the brain, right? We know that now. But there was a time they didn't know that. And actually, they, there was a thought that the heart was the center of emotion in the body. And that is why, you know, whenever you see things relating to the heart, you know, is relating to um, things relating to, the, to emotion, such as, you know, and hence songs traditionally were made like that. 
for those of us of the um, Catholic, Catholic religion, you know, the sacred heart of Jesus, you know, and you see Mary, um, and it, you know, the, the heart is there and it has it gilded when you see the images, right, in terms of emotion relating to the heart itself. But for a long while, it was, it was believed that the heart was the center of emotion in the body. It wasn't until neuroscience came in in the early 19th century that, they, that that thought was moved that emotion actually resided in the brain. But they just kept it because, you know, it had all of this tradition, rich history behind it. So they just left it there, you know, in terms of the seat of um, emotion, they left it with the heart. Uh, but it sounds better to imagine a song, Dogo Break in my Cerebellum. It doesn't sound as good as Dogo Break in my heart. So they just left it there. Okay, good. Last thing I want to look at, just one more. So this is looking at the membranes. This is the heart, the pericardium, right? And the pericardium, very important in terms of protecting the heart from, as quite rightly said just now, you don't want, if it keeps rubbing, it will cause uh, a rupture to occur. You could have hemorrhaging or bleeding internally. And what will happen? Your blood pressure will drop. Subsequent to that, the heart will beat faster in terms of increasing. It's a vicious circle. Rupture, blood pressure drop, heart beating faster to get the blood pressure up, more blood, more hemorrhaging. And then what will happen eventually, dot, 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 you'll go into shock. And after shock, what will happen, dot, 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 you'll begin to speak with the ancestors. All right? Suddenly you'll be like, hello, great grandmummy. What are you doing here? And she'll be like, what are you doing here? If it is great grandmummy has passed before. All right, so very important to note, pericardium, protective layer, it's a fluid filled sac around the heart and it prevents friction from, between the heart and the lungs in particular, which would lead to um, hemorrhaging ultimately with the heart and ultimately death as well, okay? All right, so that's it for today in terms of the um, lecture. So as we mentioned today, we looked at anatomical directions associated with the body. We looked at the, um, the organs associated with the body itself, circulation associated with it, the importance of certain structures and in relation to the reproductive organs. We mentioned the neutrality that has to be existing before sperm could adequately reach the neck of the fallopian tube where reproduction, uh, sorry, where fertilization occurs at the neck of the fallopian tube. We also mentioned the anatomical directions, very important, particularly if you're going to surgery. And it also helps both in the medical field, helps communication. When you say you have a pain in your chest, well, if you say a pain in your chest at the level of of um, L5, which is lumbar vertebra number five, is very specific. So that's why anatomical directions and reference points, they're very, it's, it's very well needed in the medical field for specificity. And then of course, we spoke lastly about the pericardium in terms of protection as it relates to friction. Okay, we good so far? Yes, yes sir. All right. All right, so let me, I'll stop the recording. No. So one question.